what did the constipated mathematician do? What? He used a pencil to work it out. <laughs> We're going to talk about your favourite topic today, Dilly. I'm literally already giggling. And IBS has become a term of just like, we don't know what's going on with you, but can you get the hell out of my door as quick as possible? You know, we want to make that bathroom experience great again. <laughs> <laughs> what I lovingly like to call a constipation reset. And I mean, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> a constipation reset. <gasps> because you're given this like umbrella term, there's this false idea that, oh, we ticked your box, you have IBS, so we won't look into it any further. And so many people are just left suffering for the rest of their life. We're going to talk about your favourite topic. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, already, I'm literally already giggling because I just know the shite that's going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> literally. Um, and hopefully out of your gut yeah. after you use my tips. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> We're going to talk about your favourite topic today, Dilly. What? Poo. Are you shitting me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you knew I was going to come in the fun. You knew I was going to come in the fun. I knew you were going to come at something. Um, this is where you go. This is where you respond and you go, I shit you not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hopefully I shit you because in this video, we're going to talk about constipation. So hopefully we can help everybody get a great poo. Uh, I literally, if someone says, what's your desire? I feel like every single nutritionist is always talking about poo. It's literally the topic of discussion. It's just poo cook. It's a really important thing. You know, we want to make that bathroom experience great again. <laughs> 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 we should just drop like a picture of Trump right in the middle of this, like they're like making your bathroom great again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I know we laugh, but in all seriousness, constipation is a challenge for a lot of people. Um, and I mean, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but also in terms of the customers that we speak to on a regular basis, it comes up. Um, just in general, because I think a lot of people that are going through health issues, often constipation can be one um, because our digestive system is so sensitive to our environment, whether that be the physical environment or the food you're eating or supplements you're taking or stress or emotion. Um, but also Tox Prevent, the zeolite, um, it is a product that requires water to move through the digestive system like a lot of other products and things so just wanted to kind of talk about that I feel like we're always talking to people about this and trying to help them with constipation so I just thought it might be useful to actually throw all the information in a video so that anyone that's struggling with this can just kind of go through it and have all the information in one place Mm -hmm. Well, Would it's you? like a, it's a term now, IBSC. Is, I'm sorry, IBS, yeah, IBSC. Mm. So that they talk about IBSC being an issue for people. You know what, actually, can I just say at the start, you know what really pisses me off, mm -hmm. like actually, and really gets on my nerves right, is when someone's diagnosed with IB, IBSC. I'm saying this because I remember when my mum, we were in a meeting and my mum was telling the, the health worker that she had IBS and and I remember, like, I was, I was about 18 maybe then, and I had, I had no concern. I didn't know anything about health that much. And I remember thinking, oh, what the hell's this? And I swear to God, like, a lot of, like, people are being diagnosed with IBS. And IBS has become a term of just, like, we don't know what's going on with you, but can you get the hell out of my door as quick as possible? And I don't know how other people have experienced this. Like, please let us know in the comments below, like, what your experience as being diagnosed with IBS is. But I do think today like this constipation video because i've you know we've been talking about this for the last like week or so this is really going to be some good information no like 1000% i feel like we're going to go on an ibs rant <laughs> <laughs> but, yes like 1000% ibs is an umbrella term like it's what you get diagnosed with when basically we don't know what the is going on with you um and i'm going to get in trouble for saying that but it is the truth like and I think, unfortunately, what that does is that, first of all, you're giving someone a diagnosis. And so you're changing the lens through which they see their health. And that can be a lifelong thing. So all of a sudden they go from being this person that has some uh, gut challenges or a gut issue that can be resolved to being this person that has this diagnosis. And this is me now. 
massive issue. But also because you're given this like umbrella term, there's this false idea that, oh, we ticked your box. You have IBS, so we won't look into it any further. Mm -hmm. And so many people are just left suffering for the rest of their life when there's so many issues that could be resolved. Or there's so many more things that we could look at to try and support you. Um, but no, this is a constipation video. No, but I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was just going to say though, just like carry on what you just said there. Yeah. You, if you then get look at the like you get diagnosed, and I'm going to put put like you know commas on there. There, if you get diagnosed with IBS, you become a marketer's wet dream. You literally become a marketer's wet dream because they're just like, I can just say something to you and you will just buy it because mm. if you're constipated, you will do everything you can to like get that poo out. I shit you not. (laughs) Sorry. This is just going to be all the toilet related humor. While you're you're talking today, I'm going to sit and be just like scrolling, getting all the toilet jokes together. It is true that, I mean, we do laugh, but it is true. Like, I mean, I think gut issues in general can be actually really, really uh, debilitating. Mm. Um, But even one gut issue, which is constipation, which is what this video is about. <laughs> we will get to it. Um, even that alone, um, you know, I think most people have probably experienced constipation in a fleeting sense for mm. some reason. And that's it's so uncomfortable. Like you feel bloated out, you feel clogged up, you just feel heavy, you feel it's so uncomfortable and it can actually be quite painful. And that's when you experience it in a fleeting way now and again. Mm. But like imagine experiencing that on a regular basis. Imagine constipation being your baseline. Yeah. That's what normal is to you. Like that has to massively impact your life. Mm. It's not right. I mean, just to give everyone a bit of an insight into mine and Tracy's relationship, we like to talk about poo quite a bit. And, uh, I Particularly like to go... since we have a daughter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, obviously I like to go into the absolute graphic detail. And like even this morning I was like, T, it hurt. <laughs> this was legit the conversation <laughs> on the way to work this morning. I have morning. no shame. I have no shame. <laughs> what is our life? Um, Actually, you know, you're t- sorry, just to add on to what you said there, it's interesting because even when I've spoken to people randomly, I still remember some of the conversations. I remember talking to this girl, right? And she was telling me that she pooed once every three or four days. I was just like, uh, what? And I remember her saying to me, like, that was normal. Like, she felt like that was her normal, like, a normal transition. I was like, that's not normal. If you are pooing once every four days, that's not normal. Because you have to remember, stool or poo or whatever you want to call it is literally duty. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Stool, poo or duty, whatever you want to call it, is literally waste product. It's your body's excreting what it doesn't need and it coming out the system. You do not want that sitting in the gut and just causing inflammation. Yeah, I mean, you don't know what... I mean, I don't know. We're just talking off the cuff here, so Mm. there might be research about it out there. But, you know, theoretically, if stool is sitting in the digestive system for a long time or in the colon for a long time, you don't know what could be being reabsorbed back into the system, you know? Because that's a main... Um, that's a main the main function of a bowel movement is to eliminate waste product Mm. so you don't know what could be getting reabsorbed if it's hanging around too long that'd be really interesting research I'm actually going to look that up after this and that's why I take talk to prevent (laughs) (laughs) Um, no but honestly I mean I I actually do think there's a lot of people out there who for whom having a bowel movement every two to three days is their normal. And it's so sad that they have gotten to a place where, you know, they haven't gotten the support they need to the point that they've just accepted, okay, this is my normal, and they just push through it. Because, again, that's horrifying. That's so uncomfortable. And I've spoken to so many people who experience Mm. not just constipation, but, you know, significant gut issues in lots of ways, be it bloating or flatulence or diarrhea or constipation or anything like that. And it really it's physically uncomfortable, but it can actually be emotionally and physiologically uncomfortable because of, as you say, the potential for, you know, your toxins not being Mm. removed properly or efficiently. Um, And that's a big problem. Yeah, and you've got the gut-brain axes as well. 
So whatever's going on in your gut affects your brain and whatever affects your brain, that's a major, major, major problem. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, can we con- <laughs> can we talk about constipation now? <laughs> Basically, today, we are going to answer all the questions that get Googled the most. They're all on there. People keep mm-hmm. asking us and people ask us a lot of these questions as well. And I think if you're watching this video, you are going to have an eye opener and an incredible bowel movement. Just say thank you. I really hope so. That would actually be so good if in the comments you follow any of these tips and you just like write a comment, say, thank you. Great bow move. (laughs) (laughs) That would genuinely make my day. Um, Okay, so when someone experiences constipation, the first thing I always ask is, are you hydrated? Um, And I swear to God, I'm not trying to call anyone out here, but... In my experience, I would say about 90% of the time when someone presents with constipation, it is a hydration issue. Um, And that's not as simple as it sounds. I think normally when we talk about a hydration issue, you're like, oh, how many glasses of water are you drinking? Are you drinking enough water? Um, You know, oh, it can also be water, coffee, tea, food. All of these can count towards your hydration needs. I call bollocks because, <laughs> because like the idea that a caffeinated tea or coffee contributes to hydration is just completely incorrect. So if you're told that, don't listen to it. It doesn't count. <laughs> In fact, you probably need to drink more water to compensate for that. Um, so I digress. Um, the Yes, you need to be checking. Are you drinking enough water? Um I think it's also important to look at signs for dehydration. So there's the obvious things like fatigue, tiredness, dry skin, um, sunken eyes, thirst, um, straw colored urine. So if you're peeing and it's super, super yellow, that ain't good. You're dehydrated. Um, But the reality is that you know, if you Google dehydration, those are going to be the types of symptoms that come up. But actually, those are more signs of extreme dehydration. But what I really want to talk to is that kind of middle ground, the people chronic that are dehydration. yeah, chronically slightly dehydrated, you but, know? You know, T, like you, you raised a really good point because it is like a chronic dehydration. A lot of time we'll go for these like cycles of being like hydrated and dehydrated. Yeah. And I think we're not consistent on drinking water i know i'm not i know for a fact not every single time i'm always drinking i try and be meticulous with it i drink a lot of water in the morning and stuff but in the afternoon i just forget and some times people will not drink water because they're so busy they don't want to stop to pee yeah but also i think you need to understand drinking water within the context of understanding what it means to be hydrated yeah Um, because if you just think hydration equals drinking water, then you could drink tons of water but still not be hydrated because A plus B doesn't necessarily equal C. Mm. So in terms of signs to see if you're hydrated, obviously if you have any of those symptoms, you're probably more than a little bit dehydrated um, and you definitely need to hydrate. The easiest marker I always talk about is the colour of your pee. So... I feel like we think of pee as being yellow. I don't know. I always just think of pee as being yellow. But actually, it should be clear or just like slightly off clear, like a, just a hint of yellow, yeah. essence of yellow, if you will. Um, but if it's anywhere, if it's like clearly yellow or if it's like definitely like a brownie yellow, you're very dehydrated. Or if you're in um, the nutrition industry, B vitamin yellow. No, that's no, no, no. That's true. So I will say a caveat to that is B two um, does make your pee turn yellow. So if you are taking like a multivitamin or B vitamins or anything like that, some medications and some foods can affect um, your pee as well. If it's purple, if you've probably eaten beetroot, if you ha- if it's purple and you haven't eaten beetroot, go see a doctor. Yeah. Um, But I think the colour of your pee is a really, really good indicator as to how hydrated you are because it's one of those things, as you said, it changes throughout the day, it changes throughout the week, it changes throughout the month, throughout the year because there's so many different factors that go into it. But we should all be peeing regularly throughout the day so it's a really good marker as to how you're doing then and there. I mean, 
if you don't mind me adding, the reason why like the water is so important for the stool is because if you're dehydrated, your body will pull the water from your stool into the body to actually stay functioning. Because you remember, 80% of your body is actually made up of water. Mm -hmm. So if you're dehydrated, where do you think it's going to get from? And that stool becomes harder. And because it becomes harder, your body can't pass it through because you, it's like a, that water's like a little lining. It's like a river for that poo to float on. <laughs> just have that analogy of like the, the poo boat sitting there and it just like floating on the water and going out. But it's really, I, I, I joke and I digress, but that is why water is so important and could be the reason why you're constipated. I feel like throughout this conversation you're just going to look for loads of reasons to throw out kind Shit of like jokes. poo analogy <laughs> um so apologies uh, <laughs> but that's just what we're working with yeah um so yeah in terms of looking at your pee if it's yellow if you're so showing any of the signs of dehydration that i mentioned then i think your best first bet is to drink more water um, and look at your caffeine intake, um, things like that, and balance it out that way. If that isn't working, um, or if on the flip side, you're drinking lots of water, or you're not drinking much water, but you're peeing a lot, you're peeing too much, and your urine is always clear, then that actually indicates more of a salt issue or an electrolyte issue, if you will. Um, so there's lots of salts sodium, potassium, magnesium, all of those, um, they're required by your body to actually allow the cells to draw water in. Um, and so if you're drinking loads of water, but actually you're low in salt, which let's be honest, a lot of people are because of some poor guidelines around low salt diets, but that's a rant for another day. Studies that will not be named or research that will be not named yet. Yeah. A lot of people need more salt, not less. Um, so if that's the case for you, if you're like, I'm drinking water all the time or my urine is always clear, but I'm still seeing signs of dehydration, I feel dehydrated, I'm not feeling good. Look at your diet, look and see if you're getting enough electrolytes, try it that way. And it should allow your body to absorb that water and hopefully that will help. I will say salt alone might not be enough to rehydrate it could be in some cases um but it's pretty personal here because it's based on your activity level if you're sweating a lot you're sweating out um salts if your diet is high in you know water filled foods or salts or if it's low in salts you know if you live in a hot country all of that so take the kind of in those individual factors into account um and yeah hopefully get hydrated so that's definitely number one um number two to consider with constipation is are you consuming harsh fibers um and this is a really important one for me because it's something that we really don't think about enough. Um, I'm just going to bypass the whole importance of fiber for healthy bowel movements because I actually think that, yes, that's an important piece of information, but I also think it's why a lot of people can find themselves in this place of potentially having too much fiber. Um, because if you're having little to no quality fiber in your diet, then yes, absolutely, you require fiber. And that fiber is needed to pull in water in the digestive system, create kind of that solid mass that moves through the colon and, you know, out the other end. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I really wanted to address is all these people who are on these kind of healthy or medical kind of protocol type diets. Um, and, you know, often these are prescribed for to support a certain health issue and they can work really, really well. Um, but what I often see is that these diets tend to be tend towards being kind of lower in carbohydrate, maybe slightly higher in protein. That switch over alone, if you're not used to it, can kind of cause a little bit of constipation. But where it can get a little dicey is that when we are switching away from these carbohydrate filled diets, we often are leaning on really, really fibrous foods. So we're kind of switching 
to kind of, you know, protein and then greens. Like you, you often hear like eat loads of green leafy veg. We eat loads of green leafy veg. It is really healthy. But for some people, if that's all you're eating, then you're not really getting enough of that kind of soluble fiber or maybe your requirement for water has increased in order for the body to process all of those fibrous foods. Take on top of that the addition of fiber supplements. So it's really common to prescribe psyllium husk, yeah. flaxseed, um, glucomannan. Like these supplements, whether you take them in food form or encapsulated, they're really, really commonly prescribed when people experience constipation, which if the cause of constipation is a lack of fiber can be helpful, but really you should probably try addressing it with food first because while these fibers have a lot of benefits, they are also really, really harsh fibers. And by harsh fiber, I mean that they require a lot of water in that digestive system to form a soft enough stool to move through the the system. So it's definitely something to consider because I think sometimes when you you experience constipation, but you're on a so-called healthy diet, you kind of think, well, diet isn't the issue because I'm eating loads of fibre, so that can't be the issue, but just consider it. But I think a lot of people don't really understand, like, soluble and insoluble fibre. It's actually quite funny you mentioned that, because a lot of people reach out, and when you say the word soluble and insoluble fibre, like you said, the go-to is, oh, it's psyllium husk. They won't think about the grains, the carbohydrates, they don't even know the role of protein. Mm. So I think for this video, Tracy's going to drop, soluble and insoluble fiber and explain it in the description because i think just read the description it will explain soluble and soluble fiber to you it's, it's a really basic understanding but we all talk about the variety in the diet mm. and that's it if you just sit there having a scoop full of psyllium husk in your water because trust me there are a lot of supplement companies who will bring out psyllium husk and tell people and a lot of companies will literally produce psyllium husk as a powder and give it out like the relief of constipation. But if the person's having too much soluble fiber, they're just adding to the issue, aren't they? Well, if the person's having too much fiber. Yeah. Um, well, no, because I mean, again, psyllium husk, flaxseed, glucoman, and there's lots of benefits to taking those things. Um, but I think for whatever reason, it's just something we don't think about. Take it in balance. Um, and I guess um, with kind of the maybe an easy way to think of insoluble and soluble. I always think of insoluble of like the slightly softer fibers. So think of your kind of your grains or your um, tuber vegetables, you know, your sweet potato um, and anything that kind of can absorb that slightly more starchy. Um, This is a generalization. Um, That's slightly more kind of starchy stuff that can easily absorb water or even holds water more when you cook it. You're thinking that more with your uh, soluble than your insoluble, which I call your harsh fibers. Mm. Um, You know, your green leafy vegetables, anything that takes a lot of chewing um, that doesn't dissolve easily with with cooking. Um, And I would say your kind of glucoman and your psyllium husk, things like that, they definitely... um, I would put them in that fibrous category simply because they require so much water um, to move through the digestive system. Again, there's a lot of benefits to them. So if it makes sense for you to take them, I'm not saying stop taking them, but I'm just saying you need to consider the quantity of water you're taking if you are also taking these in addition. So Tracy, one of the things that we talk a lot about is like the low histamine diet Mm -hmm. and like people that are food sensitive. Can that also play a role? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think like food sensitivities or intolerances or allergies and things can definitely play a role. Um, Particularly, I always think when someone's experienced constipation for like quite consistently for a long period of time, as opposed to, you know, having healthy, regular bowel movements and then experiencing a bout of constipation, if it's been quite chronic, I think often the first place I'll look is that kind of food sensitivity, see if there's anything going on there. Um, Because don't kill me, but a really common culprit is dairy. Also, (laughs) gluten is quite a common culprit. Um, Everyone's going to hate me for saying that, but it's true. Um, So if you're one of those people that's always kind of like been on that line, I definitely suggest doing an elimination diet. Um, It's the 
easiest way to kind of figure out what suits your body, what doesn't. Ideally, do it with the support of a nutritionist or practitioner. Um, Again, I, you know, we know we're not big fans of the low histamine diet. We're not fans of elimination. What are you talk about? I'm a massive fan of those diets. <laughs> All I talk about. We're I'm not. Like, yeah, we're great. not here for the kind of elimination restrictive diets. That's not what we're saying. But in terms of trying to figure out if you do have a sensitivity or intolerance, I do actually really like the old school method of um, an elimination diet, um, and. Simply for for people where a food is contributing to it, simply eliminating or reducing that food or resolving the issue that could be contributing that because a food intolerance or sensitivity isn't necessarily like a true immune reaction to yes, that Tracy, food. Say that once again. <laughs> say that once again because people literally will like do that food intolerance test and be like, oh my God, I can never have this again. It's like, oh God, it's the most painful thing we have to listen to. But it's also really problematic because if you just jump straight to doing an intolerance test Mm. and then, you know, it shows that you're reacting to everything and you're having to remove all of those foods without any plan for And all the joy from your life. And all the joy, but also (laughs) potentially all of the nutrients, you know, and that's causing stress, which can affect the the digestive system like it's not a good situation um so i'm not saying here that you know you check for intolerances and then you do that slow sad descent into a really really restrictive diet and that's where you're stuck forever that's not what i'm saying um because a lot of you know food reactions can actually just be caused not from a true immune response but actually um just inflammation or too much histamine or like a myriad of different things that could be causing your food to just or could be causing your system to really kind of misfire and kind of just react to everything but really what's happening is it's being aggravated by everything it's not necessarily allergic to everything a a dirty word a leaky cut it's a a naughty (laughs) word a leaky cut yeah no but honestly I'll I'll tag a video in the description for the leaky cut one but honestly I think you know if you do find like if you have done an intolerance or an allergy test and it's coming up that you react to like 20 different things that's not normal and we need to stop suggesting that it is <laughs> um to me that's a true indication of okay there's inflammation issues going on there's definitely some permeability often referred to as a leaky gut um Shh, don't say it too loud people get offended there's potentially some histamine issues going on and that definitely should be something that you look um at with a practitioner but anyway i digress Sensitivity to food can definitely be a contributor to constipation, especially if it's been kind of consistent uh, throughout your life or consistent with a change in diet or something like that. I mean, you raised a point, and I'm going to like move a bit forward here now, because you talked about psychological stress. Mm. And one of the things that we've noticed a lot is when people do some sort of a diet or restrictive diet, it psychologically can mess you up. So can you talk a bit more about the psychological side of things? That's that, I think that's a, a bit of an eye-opener for a lot of people. Mm. Well, actually, I would say um, kind of like stress or emotional turmoil or kind of disruption, any sort of like mood or emotion challenges. Like can... when you're feeling shitty? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, it's another one. Um, but that can also be... a big contributing factor to constipation you know it's not just about the food again Mm. there's so much more to the equation of of constipation so if you're kind of sitting here listening and you're thinking well I struggle with constipation but actually my diet is amazing um I'm drinking enough water I have enough electrolytes you know all of those I don't have a food intolerance um but I'm still struggling with constipation then take a look at your stress levels or Um, You know, if you've been through any significant kind of trauma or um, you're emotional about something, you're going through something, as we all do, Um, because stress can not only on a physical sense, it can kind of cause you to contract your your muscles. I used to always say when I was in clinic that everybody has something and it 
what I meant by that is that when we're really stressed or overwhelmed, usually we all have some kind of default place that we go to. You know, for some people, it's contraction of the head. So we have like migraines or headaches. For some people, it's back pain. And for a lot of people, it's gut issues. And, And that's often coming from the stress. So it's causing that like constriction, contracting. And that's just going to mechanically slow down bowel movements and that's going to contribute to constipation but also the release of cortisol which is your stress hormone in the body that puts us into fight or flight mode and if you're tapping on that cortisol release constantly which let's be honest a lot of us do um, it's going to put you in that fight or flight mode on a more consistent basis and our digestive system just well our body just wasn't designed for that because that takes us out of the parasympathetic place which Mm. is where digestion is supposed to happen so if your body is constantly being pulled out of the place where it needs to be to digest that's going to contribute to constipation so getting those and i mean i guess in terms of counteracting that first of all identifying it so identifying if stress um or you know strong emotions and stuff could be a challenge for you and contributing to your constipation and then as a means of supporting that trying to really look at what's contributing to your stress maybe seeking out some you know therapy or support or you know um, stress management techniques we're really big fans of breathing deep breathing I know you have a few videos on Instagram um, showing kind of different breathing techniques really having a look at that um, can go a long way yeah it's interesting because like I think you know you raised a point there like we tighten our bodies up Mm. you're essentially creating like a blockade of it and there's literally this funny I'm going to tell you a bit about like a personal thing with me and T. So I always say to T, there's there's days where I call it my emotional release poos. <laughs> it's all coming out. I thought you'd, it's the negativity shit. Neg- I'll call them negativity poos. That's it. Negativity poos. I'm like, that's some negative energy flowing out through me. You and literally like walk out of the bathroom and be like, T, I just had a negativity poo. And it's the best thing. I'll be like, I'm so happy for you. Yeah, like so happy, the best. I don't know what it is. Like, I think it's like a bloke thing. We just love talking about our poops, don't we? Yeah. But well, yeah. it also, it does feel good. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and so it's like a detox, if you will. But it is like, you know, you talked about the, the psychological stress and it's so true because we literally will like tighten up our systems. But then we, you need to talk about movement mm. because I fully, I am fully of the opinion that when you're a sed- sedentary and you're in your offices and you're sat on your ass, and let's be honest, a lot of times, like worse now, we're sat on our ass for a couple of hours when we're doing these we're preparation, these talks, you can come constipated, right? This does have an effect. I'm not just making this up. I mean... Lack of movement? Yes and no. Um, So I think movement is a really, really important, um, like, factor in our overall health, but particularly for bowel movement, because... There, it is a mechanical thing in a sense. It's not just, um, you know, about having the right nutrient balance and having enough water and all of that. There is also a mechanical element. And so if you're, I think we really need to be honest with ourselves. If you live a very sedentary lifestyle, if you're sitting all of the time, then, you know, there isn't any of that kind of like physical force or like that gravitational force that's kind of helping to kind of move those those movements helping to get your digestive system going and let's be honest like how many of us like say after Christmas or after like a really big meal we're sitting around we're cozy we're chatting we ate too much we feel really crap you go out for a walk or a run and like within like 20 minutes half an hour you're like ooh. I need to go to the loo. Like, that is that is a thing. Is that runner's belly? No. <laughs> <laughs> when they, like, have, like, really bad diarrhea? In the I, of the no, room. I'm not, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in running, so we'd have to ask, but I don't think so. Um, but, yeah, like, doing some stretching, some walking, some running, whatever your movement is, that mechanical aspect is also really important. Some squatting. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, so again, be honest with yourself about like, am I actually moving enough if this is an issue for you? But also, um, you know, not just exercise, but 
there are certain cases where certain digestive issues can be a purely mechanical function. Oh, and particularly it's something to consider if, um, you know, say you're um, going, say you're seeing a practitioner and you're taking certain medications or supplements or you're changing your diet or you're doing all of the things um, to support your gut and you're just not noticing a change, then there can actually be some cases where there's a mechanical issue. So that definitely should be um, looked at if you've kind of exhausted all of these other points. And there's a lot of, you know, specialist practitioners and like masseuses or kind of body workers and things out there that can actually do some mechanical work on the digestive system to support that movement and flow. I don't want to talk about it too much because it's not my area of expertise and there definitely can be, you know, challenges to it. So I wouldn't just go off and start like poking and squeezing your belly. Um, but it's another oh. aspect that you could look at. That's what I want to do right now. Sit there, <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting because I always say to people, when you have like your dinner or your lunch, literally just go for a 20 minute walk. Mm -hmm. Like just get out the house because I think so many of us have become used to just like eating and then sitting down. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like, I am guilty of it, man. The minute mm -hmm. I eat my lunch, I will sit down and just a quick little walk. And that will increase that process and trust me when I go to the gym I, I, I notice it in the morning I, I'll, I'll notice what happens nobody ever needed to know that Tracy this is information that everyone needs to know <laughs> but also not just with not just with constipation but also movement after eating or particularly kind of before and after a meal can help with that blood sugar balance assimilation um, you know, digestive processes. So even whether that's going out for a walk or literally doing a few like squats or press ups or whatever, that will really, really help. So getting into that habit is good. Okay, I'm going to move forward now. And mm -hmm. I've got to ask you this because this is something that really interested me was hormones. I did not know hormones played a role in constipation. And it's only the last few years where a lot of people have mentioned me, but You've talked about this a lot to me in the past, so please tell me, what's the link between hormones and constipation? This makes me so genuinely angry, because as if we didn't have enough to do with <laughs> um, Estrogen. Estrogen can trigger constipation, and it's not a fun thing. And it makes me annoyed, because as someone that has dealt with estrogen dominance in my mm. past... It's not a fun situation. So anyone out there uh, who might experience some constipation um, in and around their cycle, um, that's often estrogen being the culprit. Um, so on a base level, I think if you're experiencing constipation and you're... Um, and you have any kind of known hormonal imbalance or suspected hormonal imbalance, maybe you experience PMS, you have PCOS, you're premenopausal, you're menopausal, any sort of thing like that, um, estrogen could be um, contributing to that. Um, so two of the main uh, theories behind that is one estrogen can actually directly affect the digestive system by kind of slowing down the rate of contraction so that like your stool isn't moving as as smoothly through the the bowel um, but also from an indirect space estrogen can affect cortisol so your stress hormone which I spoke about earlier um, and so in that same way it can increase that stress in your body challenge the parasympathetic mode or the digestive mode um, and increase your chances of experiencing constipation. So in those cases, you might, again, do all of the things that we think about doing for constipation, which is eat our fiber, drink our water, move more, but you still might not be getting results. And so it might not be until you can balance your estrogen levels that actually you see a change. So Tracy, what else actually can contribute to constipation? I think another thing that we don't often talk about within the context of constipation is not eating enough. So it's really not uncommon in today's diet culture to, you know, either be on 
a calorie restrictive diet maybe if you have some eating issues maybe you kind of restrict your food intake um, sometimes with people that follow fasting I mean I wouldn't really put fasting in that bracket of a diet but one of the big hurdles I can see with people that do try fasting is that when they're eating within that restricted window maybe they're not actually getting enough food um, and it sounds really simplistic, but sometimes it is the simplest things that are the are the main cause is that if you don't have enough food in your system, then your body isn't going to have enough like solid mass to actually create stool. Um, so it's definitely something to consider if you're experiencing constipation, if you're not having enough bowel movements, are you actually eating enough? I think when people kind of get to that point of like restrictive diets as well, or they're following like low histamine, we kind of build a bit of food phobia as well. And that food phobia can stop us from eating because we're so worried about like, are we going to react? And if I'm going to react, when should, I, when should I eat? So people just think I'm better off just starving myself or not eating or then they use the term fasting because they want to get their scared of eating as well for that case of reaction right yeah and i mean it it makes sense because i think particularly back to what we were saying about like restrictive diets when we do get into this place of feeling like oh my god food is the issue i'm reacting to everything i need to cut 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 i'm allergic to this i this is too high in histamine this is too high in protein or fat or fiber or sugar or whatever the thing is that we're telling ourselves that we can't have you know it can really kind of push you into a corner and if you're stuck in a place where you can only eat you know 10 types of foods then you can get into the place where actually if you look at it holistically you might not be getting enough food in there to make regular bowel movements yeah that's interesting you know um when we were talking about when we were trying to set this video up, you mentioned consistency. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so I think that something to consider is that our digestive system, our bowel movements, it's very responsive and reactive to our environment around us, which is an amazing thing in a lot of ways. If you want to like go down the rabbit hole sometimes of talking about how our gut microbiome interacts with our environment and how there can be a difference between you know the local foods the the reaction of local foods we eat versus foods that are flown in from other countries that's fascinating but just in a very like kind of general way you know if we're changing our diet or if we've been through you know some trauma or we're dealing with something difficult if we're traveling um if we you know eat more one day and less another day if we're you know change flip-flopping on the amount of liquid we're we're intaking all of these different things it can really affect the the bowel if we're you know taking a new medication taking some new supplements changing the dose of medication or supplements changing the brand of you know medications or supplements all of these can have an effect on our digestive system so what i kind of recommend is if you have any changes like that give yourself a few days to kind of regulate catch up most of the time it'll just resolve itself but if it doesn't then have a look at some of the other things that that I said or particularly in the case of if you're taking um, a medication or a supplement you know have a look at how that works and if that could be contributing. The medication thing's interesting because one of the things that we do a lot of work on is, is migraine as many of you may know because of like Dolovan and it's really funny how many people are become constipated because of medication and medication could play a role. But then we also have the same issue with Toxaprevent, Zeolite. Now, don't get me wrong. Not everyone gets constipation. It's like one in 1000 people will get constipation. And a lot of that's down because of the different tips. It's not actually the physical medication, the product. It could be a whole heap of things, but we managed to blame that specific thing. Yeah, we can kind of get fixated on on one thing and decide that's the problem. Um, but yeah, as you say, I think one of the reasons we wanted to chat about constipation is not just because it's your favorite topic, but um, also because some people will notice that their uh, stool gets a little bit harder. Um which, again, isn't the case for everyone, you know, as we would know, because we bloody hound the stuff and we're fine. <laughs> um, but 
essentially what's happening is there's a lot of medication and supplements and zeolite. Um, they all require water to actually work in the digestive system as they move through. They all require water to do what they need to do. And so when we add something new in or, you know, even if we're taking one new supplement or one medication or, you know, if we've included five in one go and all of a sudden we're experiencing constipation, then first we need to look at, you know, OK, which of these could be fighting for water in the digestive system? Let me increase my um, water appropriately for whatever I'm taking. Does that resolve it? If it doesn't, then maybe you need to be looking more holistically, maybe introduce things more slowly. Some um, products will have a greater effect, some will have less. Maybe some of the products that you're taking are also battling for salts or, you know, some of those electrolytes or some of those nutrients like magnesium in particular that can support um, bowel movements. Um, this isn't the case for zeolite, but I'm just talking other supplements and medications. Sometimes they might reduce your stores of other salts like potassium or magnesium. So first off, drink more water appropriate to how many, um, to whatever you're taking. But then secondly, just kind of consider a little bit more holistically if there's anything that could be challenging that healthy, wonderful bowel movement. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand that they could be blocking the, themselves from becoming blocked up i knew i literally knew from your face that you're going to try and make a, a joke there <laughs> i literally you, you've you've given me one of my favorite topics and you're trying you've got to understand i'm going to become uncensored and unfiltered and i'm going to make as many jokes as i possibly can you live for the dad joke i, I think i've just got a shitty sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that's usually the case anyone that's you know obviously in our context taking tox prevent but also just supplements and medication in general and you're like all of a sudden you experience constipation that it can also it can often be the thing that's just tipping you over the edge if and particularly if you're already maybe taking some harsh fibers you've changed your diet maybe you're not drinking enough water you're not taking enough salt it can always often be like the straw that breaks the camel's back in a sense so um yeah just have a look at that that's amazing t i think you've literally pooed a lot of like controversial products out there really that was so good no, that, that, my intention. that was a good pun. That was a good pun. Um, no, no I just, I'm, I'm, what I mean by like is like because people are so often and quick to kind of go to like your supplements and look mm -hmm. at like taking things like psyllium husk and they're recommended by people that just don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I've always admired is the fact that you've got that holistic approach of looking at everything else. And I think when you're working with some awesome practitioners like yourself, you can actually, there's more to it than meets the eye. And I think a lot of people don't realise that, that there's more, to, it's not just about water. And it's you've got to link all these different things and try all these different things. But a lot of people go, oh, it's because it's just lack of fibre. No, it might not be lack of fibre. It could be water, it could be something else. And I think that's what you've highlighted so in so much really, really clear detail. Well, thank you. I mean, I think in a lot of cases we can't forget the common sense approach, you know, like really just kind of consider, okay, you know, what's making sense for me, what's going on. Um, but just before we finish, I just wanted to mention in the context of supplements and medications, one that I should point out is probiotics. Um, because I, I feel like there is this idea that probiotics like help you go as opposed to like, contribute to constipation i don't know if that's just me but i feel like that's a general idea but Tea, and that can we we need to <laughs> probiotics or or live bacteria as allowed yeah. to call because of the licensing changes and stuff that's a completely separate topic because shit man <laughs> <laughs> no, no, a no, lot no. of people like i do think the more billions of bacteria get into your gut the better it is yeah which is not the case and maybe something we can talk about we but... need to talk about this i think we we really talk about because it's not about that's we don't we don't um if anyone's ever wondered why we don't have a probiotic in our, in our portfolio this will open your There's eyes to why more to it, yeah but anyway that's just one to consider because i think sometimes um 
you just like you just automatically assume that that must be helping that you don't consider it in the equation and that could actually be what's causing the constipation so just keep that in mind as well um but one of the other things I wanted to mention was a what I lovingly like to call a constipation reset and I mean you know what I'm talking about <laughs> constipation reset <gasps> <laughs> you know what I'm talking oh, about. God. Don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking oh, about. You got to be shitting me, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is essentially like I just believe that we should all feel as good as we can as often as possible, and it would just make life a more joyful, wonderful place to be. Um, and there. If you're feeling really, really clogged up, um, there are certain things that can help. So vitamin C, taking vitamin C, uh, that can help the toilet afterwards. Um, Taking vitamin C or magnesium to bowel tolerance um, can really help just, just get that release. It's not going to relieve constipation because it's a whole digestive issue, constipation. But if you are kind of clogged up and you're just like, I am reaching my breaking point, it can be a nice reset until you manage some of the other things that we we spoke about. Um, And again, like for most people listening, taking magnesium or vitamin C to bowel tolerance isn't going to be that high of a quantity um, and it's going to be safe. But again... I don't know your story. I don't know your individual set of circumstances. So please do, you know, use common sense. Talk to your doctor or a practitioner um, if you do have some complex health issues going on and just talk to them about it first. But as I say, for a lot of us, like just popping a little bit of vitamin C, maybe having a magnesium bath or I really like... um, magnesium citrate powder dissolved into water um citrate tends to work quite well for taking magnesium to bowel tolerance and yeah it can just be like a quick way to release and allow yourself the thinking space or the allow yourself the space to kind of think about some of the other points i mentioned and maybe tackle those for a more long-term solution yeah, I think maybe um, tag one of your products, your favorite go-to products. I think in the in the oh, description yeah. Yeah, might yeah, be a yeah. good idea to there's tag few, one in there. Yeah, there's definitely a few um, kind of powders. Tracy's and stuff nutritious like that. recommendations. <laughs> well, as you know, because there's always a pot of like magnesium and vitamin C in the cupboard because they're just kind of those things that there's a lot of practical uses to them, mm. and it's not something that we take all the time, but it's something that like for particular ailments they can really support. So it's good to have on hand. Well, I think I think uh, I think we've covered a lot today so i'm going to end with a joke that i heard when i was 13 years old oh god what did the constant what did the constipated mathematician do what he used a pencil to work it out (laughs) okay that's not one of the points that's not advice that's not advice i heard that when i was like 13 years old and that joke every time we were talking that hit my head i was just like Const- Maybe you were building that up for this moment. I th- literally like, think that joke was building for this moment. Yeah, literally, yeah. like constipation was building up. <laughs> I'm going to start. I'm gonna we start. should just leave you here for like 20 minutes and it could be like the bloopers reel or something like no, that. No, but, no, um, good. There's nothing else to say. I feel like we should just leave that right here. Yeah. You know? Hey, listen, I'm going to say... Um, if you have enjoyed this video, please do hit that subscribe button. Yeah. Um, the jokes will keep coming. The bad dad jokes will keep coming. And I will do everything I possibly can to make Tracy laugh. So, yeah, please do leave a comment if you've got something you want to say about this video. Share some knowledge. Maybe you've got a trip, a, you know, a tip, a, a trip. tip, a trip, a tip that we would need to know a about trip, constipation. A Tracy tip. Yeah, a Tracy tip. You know, I never know. So please leave it in the comment section. And- yeah. And also, I just I just genuinely hope that um, some of those points are useful because it does really suck. Like it's really uncom it's uncomfortable to feel uncomfortable. Um, and yeah, I really hope that offers some support and relief. And yeah, cool. Bit of verbal diarrhea there. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> I heard that. I picked okay. that up. I heard that up. <laughs>